Hello and welcome to the full extended cut of the Irishman Abroad Big Sunday interview exclusive to our Patreon subscribers here on Patreon.com. Thank you so much for supporting our show and allowing me to make this podcast into the future. Well, Dr. Gary O'Toole devoted the first part of his life to becoming the best swimmer he possibly could. He won medals, represented Ireland at the Olympics, won gold at the World University Games and bronze at the European Championships. And all the while, he was oblivious to the horrific sexual and psychological abuse being carried out upon dozens of his teammates by the coach in charge of Irish swimming for all those years. Then, in 1990, on a flight to a competition in Australia, one of the assistant coaches, Chalky White, asked Gary if he had been abused like he had. Nothing would ever be the same again. Dr. Gary O'Toole was in his early 20s when he set about gathering together the stories and all of the victims he could find so that George Gibney could be imprisoned. What happened next, the courage those victims showed and how Gibney evaded jail and skipped the country is covered in the incredible podcast, Where Is George Gibney? If you'd like to go back and hear my conversation with the man behind that series, Mark Horgan, recorded about a year ago I think and it's free here for you to enjoy in all of its uh, every single minute of it in fact I have to thank Mark Horgan for setting up this conversation with Gary O'Toole really appreciate it shout out to Mark and the second captain's boys today Dr Gary O'Toole is of course practicing orthopedic surgeon with a specialist interest in adult arthritis and knee sports injuries He took this call after coming off the wards after a full day at work. A huge thank you to Gary for this conversation. It's the Dr. Gary O'Toole episode of An Irishman Abroad. That's the small talk. Now let's get down to business. Now, your programme. What's the big idea? Well, they've grown to know the Irish much better. We've now got to know how largely their mind works. I moved over here and immediately I had to up my game. I could not have done the job I I did for quite a number of years in Ireland. I had to go and earn my living in England. I think a lot of it's in my hair. I think there's a lot of Ireland in here. I had an Irish upbringing. 20 years after an Irishman couldn't get a fucking job, we had the presidency. It was some heightened awareness of how hard my tribe had had it in London. No blacks, no Irish, no dogs. Never has a nation so small inspired so much in another. So you could say there's always been a little green behind the red, white and blue. Our family is very Irish, you know. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we have a very special announcement to make at this stage. Would you welcome, please, the wonderful Charlie Thrigo! Gary O'Toole. It's brilliant to finally have you on the Irish Man Abroad. I felt like we were cursed there for a moment. Uh, the listeners won't know this, but this is our fourth swing at bat at getting this recording to happen. But it, it, it's an interview that I've wanted to do for so long, Gary, uh, probably before the George Gibney podcast came about, uh, because your name is so connected to two things that uh, have such a checkered past in Irish history, swimming and justice. And when we look at the Gibney story, I wondered, what do you think justice is now? And what is justice in relation to this? And whether your relationship with the sport of swimming has deteriorated as a result? Firstly, Jonathan, thanks very much for the invite uh, to the podcast. I'm a fan of the podcast and uh, listened, uh, was attracted to it really uh, during COVID. And your trials as a, an athlete uh, always <laughs> chuckles somewhat. Um, but I think that uh, to answer your first question about justice, I think justice is very personal. Uh, I, um, and you're referring to the fact, obviously, that um, we've had three uh, Olympic coaches in succession, all three of whom were charged with uh, child sexual abuse. Only one of them um, escaped on appeal. The other two that used the same appeal mechanism were, were sentenced to... Uh, uh, incarceration uh, for different different periods of time. One of them is out now living uh, f- as a free man somewhere in Ireland and, and one has since uh, died. But for me, the justice was uh, that the uh, people who George Gibney abused were uh, finally recognized to a, a wider audience than previously would have known about their, um, uh, their troubles uh, and mm. uh, their sufferings. 
<clears throat> I think that was in some way uh, justice for, for this period of time. I think that if you were to get uh, a victim of George Gibney and a victim of Derry O'Rourke and a victim of uh, Jared Doyle in the same room at the same time, talking about whether they feel any different now all these years later because one of the or two of the perpetrators had been sent to prison and one of them had not been sent to prison. I think that they would all feel the same way about their abuse and how they suffered at the hands of the coach. And for me to comment on what they think as justice would be a little bit uh, unfair and offside of me. But do I think that George Gibney um, has been served justice? Well, not in the eyes of the courts here in Ireland. I don't think justice was served, but I think that he lives a life in exile and uh, forever known and now wi more widely known, thanks to the Second Captain's podcast, as, a, um, as an abuser. Um, whereas Derry O'Rourke now is out of the public eye, has served his time and is free to roam uh, in his home country. I don't mm. know where he is, uh, but so justice varies uh, from different perspectives. Um, and being an advocate uh, for the people that were abused by George Gibney uh, puts me in a very different category to the victims of George Gibney. And I wouldn't for a second uh, think that what I would perceive as justice would be what they might perceive as justice. Uh, and I think sure. everyone has their own individual thoughts on, on that. Well, I guess, as regard, uh, sorry, yeah, as regard to my association with the, with the swimming association. Well, when I finished at the Olympic games in 92, um, um, I decided that I couldn't really go in pursuit of George Gibney and try and out him as a child abuser. Um, whilst being outside the sport of swimming. Mm. So I swam on for two years uh, during the initial um, research and um, knocking on doors of uh, potential victims. And I only retired in 1994. But when I retired in 1994, I was certainly persona non grata within the Swimming Association. I think that took many, many years uh, uh, for it to uh, quell. The Irish Amateur Swimming Association, as it was in my day, was uh, disbanded as a result of the uh, George Gibney and Derry O'Rourke uh, child sexual abuse cases and uh, was reincarnated as Swim Ireland. And I think that the, the people that were involved with Swim Ireland at the start uh, looked at me as a little bit of uh, an agitator um, and because when you're so involved with the sport and you're so close to the sport, you, you tend not to see the wood for the trees and that you get so ultra competitive and uh, get so focused on either your child or someone else uh, uh, swimming so well that you forget that this is a sport at the end of the day and it's supposed to be a healthy environment uh, for people uh, to be able to um, grow up in. <clears throat> and I felt that there was an awful lot of people there that were still involved in Swim Ireland that were involved in the IASA when I was a, um, a member of that association uh, that um, that really didn't uh, appreciate, uh, in inverted commas, the work that I had done and felt that I had uh, just been a thorn in their side. Um, I hope they've changed their minds. I think that uh, they, they will be uh, judged um, harshly uh, and have been judged harshly by the podcast that came out uh, later mm -hmm. on. So I don't have any relationship with uh, with Swim Ireland. I follow from a distance uh, the swimmers and their times. I look in awe at what they can achieve now. But I myself uh, still swim uh, two or three times a week and uh, I still love the sport of swimming. I, I, I still... Um, I'm completely in love with the feeling that I get when I go to a swimming pool. It's quite addictive. I'll be uh, first to recognize that. And it's what I do best. And it still makes me feel good about myself. Um, it, it, and as a person yourself now that's getting those endorphin uh, yeah. uh, in, infusions from your uh, participation in sport, um, you can see where I'm coming from. Um, so a hundred percent, Gary. But, I, but yeah, like you know, no, when I, I I I haven't had a traumatic experience in connection with athletics. Like my experience with athletics and sport now is predominantly, you know, Sonia Sullivan introducing this thing into my life that I thought I could never do, 
mm-hmm. and feeling the joy, as you say, the rush of endorphins, the runner's high, and as you say, the addictive quality of it. Now, were yeah. I to experience what you had in connection with that activity, I'm not sure that I could go back running. I can't, I couldn't say that for sure, but I wonder, did it take time for you to heal in that way? Was there a period when pools, chlorine, the smell, the sound of the place had a certain post-traumatic stress for you? Um, I'd have to be honest and say, yes, there was a period of time. There was a period of time about two years uh, when I didn't swim. I, I didn't swim at all. Um, and I kind of regret that now looking back uh, that I that I uh, I didn't just keep it going. But I hated everything that uh, was to do with the sport. Uh, and um, I think that uh, for many years after I finished swimming, um, I uh, retained some sponsorship deals. And that necessitated me going to uh, some organized swimming get-togethers. They, I won't so call them swimming competitions. Um, and that kept me in for a period of time. But then when I started uh, working um, uh, as a doctor, things got so busy. And unfortunately, that was the first thing that I dropped. And um, when I got back into it again, after being out for two years, um, I quickly realized, you know, that I, I do still love the sport of swimming. Mm. And that I was letting my judgment of the sport of swimming be clouded by people who were involved in a part of the sport of swimming that I was no longer involved with. Yeah. So it was um, it it was a bit of a lesson uh, for me. And um, you know, I was I remember I was um, I was cycling one night um, on a stationary bike, and I was listening to you when you were going through your stress fracture period and the frustration in your voice as you were going from one physio to another, and then you were cautiously being uh, rehabilitated back into the sport of running. And I I could, I was laughing to myself and I I was saying, you know, here's, here's a guy that, um, you know, is never going to be an Olympian, is never going to be a a world uh, championship competitor. And yet, he is taking it as serious as I would have done when I was at that up level. Mm. And the frustration in your voice was palpable, but that that's what came across to me. And it did make me laugh because you had been bitten. You were completely addicted Mm. to this. And it was when it was taken away from you, not on your terms, that was so upsetting. If you had walked away from it, you wouldn't have been so upset. But because it was robbed from you and you were told you cannot do this, then all of a sudden it becomes the most important thing in your life. And that's what swimming was for me. And I walked away from it. So I wasn't so upset for the two years, but I was upset at myself when I went back again because uh, I realized, you know, this is this is good for you. This, this is what keeps you sane. And to this day now, um, I've been swimming. Uh, and known how to swim now uh, for over 50 years. Uh, and um, it's just great. I, I just go back to it and I see what I get out of swimming. And when I listen to Sonia talk about when she runs, I can appreciate where she's coming from. And sometimes when I say stuff about swimming, people are looking at me saying, yeah, we'll give them that. We'll just nod and just walk away and we'll go, <laughs> what a fruitcake. And I can appreciate sometimes that when you're talking to Sonia, that at that level, when you're that far removed from the competitive nature of the sport, to be still so effusive about the sport can sometimes sound quite disturbing to people who haven't been bitten. And that's mm. that's, a, that's a roundabout way yeah. of saying, yes, I, I did regret my time when I wasn't doing it, yeah. Yeah, and I think you're you're also hinting at the running bores there that people know all about all too well who just, uh, you know, people can't connect with because they, they, they seem to be hooked on something that's yeah. from another planet. Uh, you know, mm. your idealism had to be part of what drove you to take Chalky up on the challenge to do something. You had an idealistic belief that you can fix this, Uh, not fix it, but on some level you can change things and at least attempt to put a stop to this. Where do you trace your idealism from or would you agree that there was an idealistic 
Gary O'Toole from day one? Well, I think that it's a heavy question, but I think that uh, when uh, Jockey confided in me, uh, he just needs someone to talk to and he just needed to say it out loud and uh, for someone uh, to be a sounding board. I, I don't think, and I might be wrong here, I don't think it would have made an awful lot of difference to him if I had said nothing um, and just said and nodded and just walked away and left him to deal with it on his own. Uh, but it, from my upbringing and from uh, my teachers and people that I had encountered uh, throughout uh, my school, um, I had a very strong sense of right and wrong. That may be a strange thing to say, but I realized what had happened to him was wrong and that he was suffering as a result of that. And I didn't do it uh, because um, Chalky asked me to do it or I didn't do it because, um, you know, Chalky had been uh, uh, wronged, but I realized that the whole system was being facilitatory towards this monster uh, that was continuing that behavior as we spoke and that was wrong and I wanted to stop that and mm. by upping that um, you had to go back and acknowledge the past and acknowledge the historical cases of child sexual abuse that this man had perpetrated and to do that the only way to acknowledge that was through the uh, the court system and that's what I did that's what I tried to do and I tried to engage with the uh, legal system in Ireland and uh, encouraged all of his victims to partake in that um, uh, system, uh, which in the end it itself uh, uh, let them down. But that's it just came down to a simple choice of what's right and what's wrong. Mm. And I'd, I'd like to say that I fast forwarded uh, 30 years and said, you know, how would you feel at 30 years time if you didn't do this? That wasn't the way it was at all. And I now live my life like that. Um, I learned that what I did could have been summed up very, very simply by how will you feel in X amount of time. And in my world of medicine now, we have this very simple test called uh, the walk home test. And it can apply to any uh, 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 field of work. And it, I always remember it one night, um, we had a very busy night in a hospital in New York and, um, we had operated on a young, uh, child. I'll give you his first name, Yehuda. And we had operated on him 48 hours earlier and we were walking home, uh, down first Avenue at about, uh, uh, it must've been one thirty or 2 AM and we'd finished in the operating room about an hour previous and we'd gone around to see the patients that we'd operated on that day. And I was walking down first Avenue with my uh, boss and mentor, uh, Patrick Boland. And we were about, uh, we were about 500 meters down first Avenue. And he said, oh, we never checked on Yehuda today. Did you round on him this morning? And I said, no, I didn't round on him this morning. And he, and he said, oh, okay. And he kept on walking and I stopped and he said, what are you doing? And I said, we got to go back. He says, what are you talking about? He said, well, we've just failed the walk home test and come back to me. And I said to my mentor, I said, <clears throat> if you walk home now, how long will it take you to get to sleep? Wondering how Yehuda is, mm. he said, I probably won't sleep. And I said, well. If we go walking back now, it'll take us another 20 minutes, but you will see him, be satisfied that he's okay, go home, sleep well, and then um, you will have done the right thing. And so let's walk back. So that's an example of something that doesn't pass the walk home test. So in surgery or in medicine, if you're driving home in your car at nighttime after operating or seeing patients and you're thinking about a patient and you think, maybe I should have done this. Well, you should have done it. <clears throat> so the ability to fast forward a couple of hours is an important way of looking at things. And whether that's hours or as in the case of Chalky and the child sexual abuse victims, whether it be 20 or 25 years down the line when you have children yourself, well, it's a great way to look at life. And that's what I do now. Yeah, you were, <clears throat> you were in your 20s. This is this is the other thing that people can't believe, right? You must get asked this all the time, Gary. In fact, I've probably seen multiple people ask you this question about 
you know, maturity ahead of your years and being us all thinking of ourselves at 20, 21 years old and how we we don't usually have the walk home test in our mind's yeah. eye. I wondered about if we could slow down kind of that trajectory of telling the, this side of it or talking through it, how much the earth shifting on its axis like hurt you or um, sent your mind swimming because when Jockey is saying these things to you on the plane to Australia you've said that the dots suddenly connected between your experience with George Gibney as an 11 year old boy homesick in the states when he tried to get into your bed uh, the the next the next period of your life must have been you know the most awful period of all because it's before as you say you've taken the action and you're now at the wheel can you tell us a little bit about exactly how out on your feet uh, out of control or that just this i can't even imagine the sense of how you saw the world through your eyes at that point getting off that plane um, getting off that plane, remember, we, we were now in uh, Perth in uh, Western Australia and had to compete in the uh, World Championships. And uh, George Gibney was the head coach uh, and Chalky White was the assistant coach. Um, so I had to go to training sessions every single day knowing what I knew about him. But actually, it was quite easy to ignore him for that period of time and just keep your head down and just do what you're told. Uh, that that was quite easy. And then I left his swimming club and I moved to, to the States for a year, actually. Um, and when I came back from the States and uh, started to work, uh, you know, and, and Chalky was always aware of what I was doing. I I was angry. I was I was very angry at um, Gibney uh, for what he had done. But I was particularly uh angered by how he had behaved when I was competing at the Olympic Games in Barcelona, that he had the gall to go on national TV and um, be very insulting towards me. But what he was trying to do was trying to break me as a person and make sure that when I came back, if I ever said anything bad about him, it would be viewed as sour grapes um, mm. and that I was trying to um, undermine his credibility by telling lies about him and he, he you know he was full sure i was going to do something because i had told him uh, why i was le leaving him and he knew exactly you know why i was un uncomfortable in his presence um so he, he knew that i would if anyone was going to do something it was going to be me so he tried to, his damnness to 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 essentially ruin me um but then when i came back he, he empowered me really because he made me angry enough uh, personally. And then I was angry enough uh, on the victim's behalf to get up and get, get go and do something. Mm. And the other thing was I had absolutely nothing to lose. Um, and people were telling the truth about his, uh, his uh, abusive behavior. I believe them. I believe that he was, uh, Gibney was responsible for an awful lot of friendships within my swimming club that had broken down as he abused either party within that friendship and then isolated them from their 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 friends and i could see a pattern and, I, and it was very easy to see once it had been pointed out to you but if it's not pointed out to you it's it's very hard to see it's like that where's wally picture you know when you see wally and when someone points him out you say of course i can see him now he's as plain as day he sticks out hmm. but when it wasn't pointed out to people, it wasn't very clear. So I wasn't worried about my reputation. I wasn't worried about my house. I wasn't worried about my family or my children. I had nothing to lose. I was actually in the perfect position to do what I did. And people have been very kind and very nice about, you know, what I did, you know, when I was 22 years of age. I said, I was 22. I didn't really know what I was doing. Would I behave the same fashion now, uh, you know, in my early fifties as I was when I, it, as I did in my early twenties, I would hope so. But now I have so much more to lose if I was to go out on the limb like that. So it was serendipity, if you want to use that, that word. Um, and it was just a case of 
encouraging people to come forward. So it, I was pushing an open door for, for, for a lot of the victims because they had had time to come to terms with it and they wanted to do something about it too. So mm. it was very lucky in some respects, very lucky indeed. So for those people that don't know about when you say he tried to ruin me and you know the deviousness of how he criticized you at the Olympics in 1992, you didn't have the performance you wanted to have. It just didn't go your way. I think you slipped at one point coming off the blocks and he basically lays the boot in, right, as a pundit. And you believe that it was to engineer the characterization of you as a sour grapes merchant. That's exactly true. So he, he, he was the person who was on the expert panel um, on his own uh, with uh, the late Bill O'Hurley, who was presenting the program. And um, it was a case of, so say if I perform the 100 meters breaststroke in a certain time, he, he would just sit back in the chair and say, it was absolutely awful. I mean, there's just no way that he's good enough to be uh, representing Ireland in the Olympic Games. He should be embarrassed uh, with his performance how he uh, ever found himself in that position i'll never know uh, this is the problem that we have he took his foot off the gas he's not training he didn't train hard enough um he's an embarrassment all of this stuff was was said in national airways and left unchallenged as well because there wasn't anyone else there to act as a foil mm. and uh it it was it, it, it was very hurtful, not for me, who was in Barcelona, because I was hurting because, you know, my first race uh, where there was no full starts, I uh, slipped, came up and was behind the, behind the field. And that's not making excuses in terms of my performance. It's just that um, I didn't actually pay attention to what was going on here. But my mother was here and, uh, and uh, you know, my close family were here. And uh, they were listening to this and getting very upset by it all. And it was just so that when, if I ever came back and said something bad about him, that people would say, well, the depths that he has uh, gone to now to try and take revenge on George Gibney, it's quite incredible. But I knew that's what he was doing. So it it, 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 it didn't bother me. I was upset uh, for my family and my family and friends. Uh, But... Uh, I would expect no less of them, really. It must have hinted at how manipulative he was and uh, that you, for the first time, were kind of seeing this kind of dirty, murky side to the man that uh, did that at all. Like, I, I, I struggle to use the term evil, right? I, I've always struggled with the concept of some people are evil. Uh, I think even Eamon Dunphy said it to me once on the show that he believes in evil, that there are evil people in the world. And I, I just don't know what to do with that. But then when you really look at the case and you look at the, the individual here, there must be part of you, Gary, that does that does believe in that, that believes that this is that yeah, kind well, of person. He uh, was um, a sick individual. Uh, you know, uh, I think pedophilia is a, a, a psychiatric illness uh, that uh, is well recognized and um, uh, um, thankfully uh, remains illegal in uh, societies such as ours. Um, uh, we need to protect the, the young and the vulnerable uh, people and uh, that's the people that they prey upon are people that prey upon young, vulnerable individuals that can't make decisions for themselves evil? Well, I think that is a term that could be used to describe them. I I think that uh, the episode in my life that you picked upon in Barcelona um, and the manipulative nature of the man, it, he, he was a, it, it, it was like as if he was uh, positioning uh, pieces on a chessboard. Mm. You know, and he didn't mind taking a few hits if it meant that he would end up with his king at the end of the game. So he he thought that I would come back and try and have a go at him, uh, but he didn't know what was going to happen. So if I was going to go and try and badmouth him or tell people that he is, you, you know, a sick individual, well, then he was going to make sure that I had 
other reasons to try and badmouth him. And that's what he was trying to do. And I think that shows, or it, um, it demonstrates the character of the individual. You and I couldn't, couldn't think like that, you know, no. uh, hopefully, uh, um, um, most people that we know couldn't think like that, but there, uh, there are people out there that are, um, that manipulative of, uh, everyday situations that, um, yes, they, they can see themselves as the, the center of the universe around which everything rotates and they just, uh, try to arrange things so that it affects them least. And they always benefit from a situation. And that's what he was trying to do. It does, when you read about it now and how you go on this journey to gather those people that were affected and abused by this man and direct them in, or funnel them towards the police. It feels like a different time. It feels like a completely different era in Irish history. Whereas now we are so much more, and I'm not saying completely believing of victims, uh, but at that time, could you describe a little bit of how much resistance there was and how much there victim blaming and uh, victim abuse was a thing at the time that if a, a story such as this arrived, people were hushed up and told to shut up it it just for for our younger listeners uh, i mean that must be part of the fascination with with the, uh, whereas george gibney is a podcast and as this entire case that we like to believe this would never happen in ireland now what do you say to that the processes that are in place now for people that find themselves in these situations are uh, so much more improved, uh, and the environment, uh, um, into which these people, uh, can, uh, contribute is much better. Uh, this was in the time before child line. This was in the time before, um, 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 psychologists that you could go and child psychiatrists that you can go and see, or if people were acting out. It wasn't a case of we need to get them help. It was just a case that they're bold, you know. So, mm. well, there were, there, it was a very different era. And I'll give you an example of what, how different an era it was. Um, when we had a number of victims who had uh, gone to see, and the way I did it was that I encouraged all of the victims to go see a psychologist um, who I had worked with in the past. Uh, who, ironically enough, I had been introduced to by George Gibney, who um, thought it would be good for the club to have a psychologist on board. He quickly realized after three or four sessions that this psychologist uh, w uh, was actually very, very good. I was interested in helping uh, children, and he was booted out of the club uh, pretty quickly wow. because of the fact that uh, Gibney would have been very afraid that if he got a one on one session with some of the uh, athletes within the club that uh, the athlete would reveal what was going on. So he disappeared, but I never forgot him. And um, I went to see him and I told him what was going on. And I said, well, you're a health professional. I'm not a health professional. I'm a medical student, but I would like uh, for these victims to be able to speak to a health professional. And then you, um, with, uh, in, with your qualified um, uh, hat on, uh, you can direct them in the correct way. So it's not a case of going to the guards and me saying to the guards, I think this man is a pedophile. Go do your work and do your due diligence and research on this man. The victims have to come forward without coercion and without being um, forced to. So how we managed that was that they went and they spoke uh, to the psychologist, Dr. John Connolly. Um, and he then spoke to them, made sure that they were in a good fit enough uh, state of mind. Uh, and if he felt that, he said, well, the next step, if this is, if you want to take it further is to go and see this person in this uh, guard station and make an appointment with them and they'll be expecting you and they'll know what it's about. So it's like I say, it wasn't that I drove them on the back of my motorbike or in my car down to the guard station and say, go in there and uh, have a chat to them. It was very, very different. Mm. And I think that uh, is similar, but. We knew that the atmosphere or the, the general public would have very 
would have huge difficulty believing uh, that a man in, of his stature would be capable of such heinous crimes. This was around the time of Brendan Smith, uh, who was at that time uh, the most notorious paedophile in, in, in Ireland. And um, um, when uh, Brendan Smith's trial was going on, the, the George Gibney uh, thing co coincided. And we said that we wanted to stop George Gibney having anything to do with swimming uh, whilst the police investigated him. And we, for that, we wanted a show of faith from the Swimming Association. And he was due to run a two-day course with age group swimmers over the Christmas period. I always remember the time of the year. And these would have been maybe 50 or 60 uh, age groupers from about the age of nine through to 15 or 16. And it was to be held in New Park Sports Centre. And myself, a victim and a husband of a victim, met with the Swimming Association one evening in the Ashling Hotel in Dublin. And there were four officials from the Leinster branch of the Swimming Association who were responsible for the course. And we said, you know, George Gibney is a paedophile. He abused this person here. He abused this man's wife um, and we're not making it up. And we want you to cancel the course in six weeks time. You can use excuses like there isn't enough interest or we cannot secure the time uh, for the Leinster branch officials to come uh, and be there. Any excuse at all, uh, you don't have to say we're cancelling it because you're a paedophile. You just don't run it because these are the people that uh, are vulnerable in the hands of George Gibney. And all he is doing is he's like having overseeing um, the potential victims uh, for child abuse of the future. I said, you can't put these people on parade in front of him and uh, expect us to stand by and just say nothing about this. So we want this stopped. And they didn't believe a word of it. They ran the course. They had nothing but praise for George Gibney. Uh, they actually went so far as um, uh, going down to the Blackrock Garda station and checking with the guards to make sure that we weren't lying. And then even when the guards told them that the they were conducting an investigation uh, because of complaints that had been made uh, by several individuals into the behavior of George Gibney, they refused to cancel the course. So that's the kind of support that was out there for victims of child sexual abuse. And the pendulum, thank goodness, has swung an awful lot uh, towards a better behavior, better understanding and better care of people that now find themselves in that situation. There's no doubt about it. Gary, I have so many more questions and I really do appreciate you taking the time to patiently answer them uh, here on the podcast. We've got an extended cut of my conversation with Gary O'Toole available on patreon.com forward slash Irishman Abroad, where I really want to ask about Mark Horgan coming to you with this podcast and this Pandora's box and your reaction when when that is presented, because there's no doubt about it. You must have known in your heart, Mark, you don't know what you're getting into here. Because at that point, there'd obviously been the Murphy Report. There'd been the book, Deep Deception. There'd been, uh, as you said, the Johnny Waterson articles, m multiple articles. Um, you had seen George Gibney be treated very differently in court to other people. You must have felt such rage and sadness for those victims. Was there any part of you that that didn't want this to go forward or worried about, well, what I'm sure this can do some good, but is it worth it? Um, it's, it's like everything. Uh, the, it, I have spoken to journalist students uh, from DCU when they were running the journalist course out there. I've spoken to people from the Tribune, uh, at the newspaper in UCD. I've spoken to people from publications abroad. I've spoken to every news agency that ever g gives me a call. I never say no to anyone that wants to talk about uh, this episode in 
either Irish history, Irish swimming history, or my own history, because I think that the, the message is so important. And if there's one person out there that it can be affected, whether it be via a piece in the newspaper or a piece online or a podcast or a, a, a you know, a video, um, I will be, I will contribute and I will happily contribute. So when Mark's brother contacted me and uh, said, it was it okay if you passed on my number to Mark and um, he, he wants to talk to me about something, I said, absolutely no problem. And when I went down to see uh, Mark, um, we met in a local uh, hostelry and um, he, he sat down, he told me his idea and he did, he actually didn't come to me first. He came to me late on in the, uh, in the process, um, because I think he was maybe, um, he wanted to make sure that he had enough work done on the whole thing before mm. come and annoy me. Whereas in actual fact, there are some people that come to me and they would just say, look, um, can you just uh, talk to us about that time? And, uh, I, I would explain it in, in depth and do their research for them. But Mark was different. Uh, he had done an awful lot of research. He'd spoken to an awful lot of people before coming to me and he'd actually gone and sought, uh, the permission, uh, from some of the uh, victims, uh, to come and interview them. So. I realized that this guy was not a fly by night journalist, uh, that he had uh, support and that he, uh, he, he was earnest in his efforts. Um, so it was, uh, with, I won't say surprise, but it was, uh, it was a pleasure to say to him, yes, of course I'll help you. Now, when Mark came to me, um, he, he came to me and, um, I had uh, been following him, uh, through second captains. Uh, I, you know, I'm a, a podcast nut. Uh, so I was familiar with his work on second captains when he occasionally would uh, go behind the microphone mm. and I was very impressed with his sharpness. Uh, he, he's very, uh, acute, uh, with a, with a comeback. Uh, he's never without research and he can always back up his opinion. Uh, which is something that I had noted even before I met him, but speaking to him on that night, uh, I did get the impression that he might not realize how big a story this is and how it might affect him. And as he got l more and more into it and he garnished more and more information about this man, I think it was like a tsunami of, uh, research and, uh, um, recordings and everything else that he was hit with. And not only that, he actually genuinely liked all the people that he had interviewed, uh, and he was an ambassador for them. The project, uh, was his project, but their legacy and mm. it weighed heavily, heavily on him. So I was absolutely thrilled when he came out of this and the podcast, uh, when it was broadcast was received so well, uh, uh, both by the victims, uh, who listened to it and the critics, uh, because let's be honest, Jarlath, it's not a pleasant story to tell. And, no. uh, there's no happy ending to this. This is not your typical Netflix, uh, uh, presentation that stick with it. It's all going to be fine by episode 11. It was not going to be like that at all. It never was going to be because the ending was all, we always knew where is George Gibney. It's just a case of retelling the story to a newer generation. And he achieved that and he achieved that, uh, with an amazing, um, um, uh, ability. Uh, and he, I would hope is immensely proud of his work. Uh, and from the victim's point of view, I think that they're happy that they, they used him for their voices to be heard. And, um, I think mm. that's the greatest praise that he can have out of the podcast. And I'm not saying anything that I haven't said to him in person yeah. either. Yeah, uh, no, not, he, he deserves every like, bit of it. Yeah, it's not that he's going to be tuning into this and saying, oh my God, uh, yeah. Gary never said that. <laughs> he never I'm, said I, that to my face. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, but like I, I couldn't I agree more. I couldn't agree more, and uh, like it is one of the defining pieces of Irish journalism of the last ten years. And when you say the 
purpose and the function of it or the outcome and the justice that we mentioned at the very start is for the continual belief of victims, of people coming forward. And if anything, I felt by the end and the response that it got in terms of more people coming forward was the true legacy of it, uh, that if justice wasn't available in the courts, that bizarrely justice could be available in some way through this podcast. Would you agree? Yes, and for the people that, there are a lot of people out there who would have been during the early 90s uh, when this case was going through court uh, would never have been in the position uh, to acknowledge the fact that this man had done it to them. And then uh, with maturity and adulthood that comes along uh, can stand up and say, you know, I turned out to be a good person and that man was an evil part of my life. Uh, and uh, the, the things that he did to me um, uh, were not right. Um, and I have been made feel bad about those things and that was not fair. Um, and um, it's given them a, a vessel uh, yeah, into which or onto which uh, to um, uh, seek acknowledgement uh, mm. from the public. And, uh, and for people who are coming forward, who are new victims uh, of George Gibney, and I say that new public victims, you know, that they, for the first time, they would speak openly about it. Um, I think that that is, has been a great service and, yeah. um, it, it takes it from, you know, the early nineties through to the early twenties now, and that's a 30 year gap. And, uh, we're still speaking about a swimming coach, uh, perpetrating, uh, horrific crimes. And it has changed the face of sport uh, in Ireland uh, for sure. It has in initiated a stay safe program within the sporting community. It has changed the environment around how uh, sports is conducted, especially at underage level. Uh, it has increased the trust uh, that parents can have uh, because, um, and there's no doubt that can sometimes be a double edged, edged sword that, um, you know, pe parents might now think, well, and after that, there's nothing ever going to happen. And once you take your eye off the ball, well, then people like George Gibney will take advantages of the, uh, advantage of the situation. And um, it hit home about, um, I suppose, about eight years ago. Uh, I was on call uh, one uh, Saturday evening and my anaesthetist uh, and I were, we had finished uh, our list and he would uh, at five o'clock and it was on a Saturday afternoon. I said, where are you going now? And he said, oh, my child. He has swimming at half five to half six and I have to, I have to go and I have to supervise there. And I said, okay, uh, good luck. And I came back then in on the Sunday and I said, how did you get on at the, um, the swimming? And he said, it was very interesting. I was uh, standing in the swimming changing rooms and I turned uh, to another guy. I said, have you any plans for tonight? And the guy said, oh yes, we're going out for dinner at eight o'clock. And he turned to him and he said, well, Meaning well, he turned to him, he said, um, but why don't you get off and I'll, I'll stay in here and make sure that nothing goes on in here. And the other parent looked at him and said, I can't do that. I'm here to make sure you don't do anything. And you're here to make sure I don't do anything. And we're both here to make sure that the children get dressed. Do you not understand how this works? And he wow. said, he said, I didn't really realize that that's why there was two of us. And he said, and he turned to me and he said, that's the legacy of the George Gibney uh, and Derry O'Rourke uh, uh, era. And I said, well, sorry about that. And he said, no, it really hit home how safe things are now. And even in school swimming, that it is taken so seriously. But the other legacy as well, though, Gary, is that that man was able to have that conversation without yes. having to, you know, kind of wink and nod or he was comfortable yeah. enough to acknowledge, no, no, we're safeguards. This is a yeah. good thing that we're doing here. And, yeah. you know, trust is at the center of why this occurred. And when we read back and if people lis have listened to the podcast or read Deep Deception, 
it was a uniquely trusting time. And, you know, you do look at things like Mad Men and you think oh, parents, you know, slapping kids that they'd never, that they're not related to, disciplining kids that they were not connected to. Trust is something that people, uh, you know, decry the loss of that, oh, Jesus, you can't trust anybody anymore. What do you think about that side of this? That trust trust was abused as much as anything was abused for this to happen uh george gibney had to win trust and then abuse that trust and yeah it, uh, what are we left with then so how, how it happened was first of all he would uh, wrangle his way into a family and um endear himself uh, to the parents and uh, tell them that uh you know they're uh, young swimmer had potential and uh, with the right coaching and the right attitude uh, could go the whole way and it wouldn't all be plain sailing that there were going to be rough periods where the swimmer themselves uh, might be a little bit moody in other words exactly clearing the path for the times when you know mm. if he abused the child that the child might be up somewhat upset by this that the parents would be the one encouraging them back into the environment where they were being abused because that he, they had been warned by this amazing coach who was able to predict these moods and uh, that this was going to happen. And then in the environment of the swimming pool, uh, he would uh, isolate people and make sure that they were competing for his uh, attention uh, and often affection. So if you were swimming well, uh, he would praise you uh, in and ignore the person who was swimming next to you. And the person swimming next to you, then they wanted that praise. They wanted to be the the twelve year old that the coach picked out and said, "Look, uh, th look how well this person swam today." So it was a two pronged attack. So he was grooming the child uh, uh, to be completely dominated and do anything that he wanted, and then the parents uh, to expect that the child was going to have emotional uh, out, outbursts uh, because the swimming was so tough but he was being tough on the child and not to worry about is it, if it ever happened and that is uh, that is what ha it wasn't just that he was able to fool the young uh, naive innocent uh, swimmers but that he was able to um, endear himself to grown, mature, um, uh, you know, adults. experienced adults, uh, that, um, I'm not saying, uh, should have known better, but were, were there, uh, and would often, uh, just want the best for their child. But if they thought the best for their child was going to be an Irish champion, well then, um, George Gibney had the history of being able to produce Irish champions and he knew how to do it and, um, it'll be worth it in the end. Mm, just and uh, parents, grooming, yeah. Parents are bizarre because, yes. uh, um, you know, they, 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 they really can behave in a fashion that uh, is embarrassing at times, you know, that when you step, take a step back and you just say, stop it, you know, you, you know, this, you're not doing this for the good of the child, you're doing it for your own good. Uh, and I'm not saying all parents are like that at all, but when I coached uh, for a short period of time, I remember uh, one coach came to me and, uh, and said, does, does young Jarlath there have the potential to be an Olympic swimmer? And I said, no, no, I don't see young Jarlath ever competing in the Olympic Games. And he said, OK, I don't see the point then really in uh, continuing this. And I said, well, I suppose if that's your goal, you're better off knowing early but you might want to talk to young Jarlath and see whether that's his goal or whether he just enjoys swimming. He said, no, no, he can be doing other things so that it comes easier. Uh, and next week, young Jarlath was gone. Really? Yeah. So it, it's a case of, do you want to play soccer for Manchester United or do you want to kick the ball around with your friends, have a laugh and, and, and enjoy yourselves? And if you take the latter choice, chances are you'll still be kicking ball with your friends when you're in your 60s, uh, all things equal, and uh, you'll still be having a laugh and still having fun. Whether if you play for Manchester United, you won't have those friends. Mm. It's a you know, strange one. It is. Strange. I spoke to Porrick Harrington yesterday, 
and he said something that I get emotional about when I when I repeat it. But he said that um, he believes that everybody should be allocated someone else's son to coach. <laughs> <laughs> such a brilliant, profound piece of knowledge because of how difficult it is, first of all, to teach your own kids anything. <laughs> yeah. But also he talked about, you know, when you are coaching your child, you're effectively trying to teach them to love it. Yeah. G- greatness will come. But he said yeah. teach and them I've, to love. I've often thought about that, that, that man, that, was honest enough to ask the question. And, you know, I, I wonder whether he was being, whether he did the right thing, whether he did the wrong thing, or what he said to young Jarlath when he got young Jarlath home. Uh, and maybe young Jarlath's, um, he, he wasn't enthusiastic about coming swimming. Maybe he was, maybe he wasn't. But um, uh, whatever happened after that anyway, he didn't, he didn't turn up. And uh, even with my own children, you know, you have to be particularly careful uh, about, um, you have to be supportive without being overbearing. You have to, you have to make sure that, you know, in the sport of swimming, they had to make sure that they knew how to swim, but, and if they w- showed any promise that you were extremely encouraging of their promise without ever appearing to be, uh, um, pushy about the, about the whole thing, a very difficult line to to negotiate um, and 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 Porik is probably right in what he says uh, about just don't get involved yeah in 1994 uh, conspiracy theorists were represented in films like Independence Day as kind of beatnik pot cookie eating um, hemp wearing uh, weirdos on the outskirts of town conspiracy theories gained so much ground in the last 10 years specifically that the view that the verdict or lack of a verdict that was reached in terms of George Gibney back then was somehow an inside job, a conspiracy theory that went from the top down, really was derided. And uh, if if people said it, it was it was shrugged off a bit. I wonder how much you did that then versus how much you do it now, knowing what we know about conspiracy theory. Yeah, and I think that what you're referring to is the the senior counsel that George Gidney used and then the members of the Judiciary Review that uh, actually uh, ruled in George Gidney's favour. And there were familial connections uh, there, but Within the legal profession, no more so than my profession in, in medicine, uh, there tends to be families that um, uh, gravitate towards those professional fields. And so it's not surprising that there might be one family uh, who uh, are uh, eminent uh, within certain subspecialties. I I have thought about it. I think that uh, to get away with something like that um, would have been... Um, Absolutely uh, shocking is the first word that comes to mind. But I honestly don't believe that it was something like that, that someone sat down and uh, that uh, this uh, decision was come upon by uh, insider uh, negotiation. Uh, The decision was three to two. Um, So um, there, there were three people that voted, uh, in favor of George Gibney being acquitted because the time lapse between the, him being, uh, accused of the crimes or being in court of the crimes and the last crime having been committed was too long. And I think that what happened after the George Gibney case was that when they looked at it in on mature reflection, um, it didn't sit well with anyone either in the public or in the judiciary and people that tried that same defense later on they they realized well hold on a second there we we didn't understand at the time that certain victims can take an awful long time to uh, process Mm. uh, what has happened to them and we have to allow for that and as an adult you don't need that time to process it Uh, so just because they waited for five or six years before standing up and accusing you 
um, that is no reason for them not to be believed or not to have their time in court. So I think what George Gibney's decision did, uh, and such was the um, retrospective analysis that it caused uh, to do with the G case or the Gibney case, that everyone else that tried it thereafter, it was a complete and utter no-no because people actually cared about the decision. And if there's anything good to come out of that, the good to come out of it was that nobody else got away with that defense th thereafter uh, yeah. because uh, the judicial system realized that it really wasn't a defense. But at the time, you could see with inexperience and lack of understanding of the processes from the victim's point of view that you could see how they would arrive at that decision. Uh, so a conspiracy theory, no. No, I, 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 I honestly don't think so. I feel like everybody wants to ask the question of you that will, will George Gibney ever have a day in court in Ireland? And I think it's quite obvious that he could never get a fair trial. Would the documents related to this ever be released? And will the victims get an apology? I think is a is a better question. I, I think an apology uh, from um, the you know the powers that be. Uh, I think a a something in perpetuity that uh, would acknowledge uh, that period of the uh, of uh, swimming um that uh, you know those years uh, where George Gibney was dominant uh, and I mean uh, from the time that he set up the uh, Trojan Club having come from the Glen Alban Club in the late 70s all the way through to him leaving in 1994 um that period of time um where there were so many people upset, uh, the Swimming Association needs to do something to acknowledge that period in their history, which because of the change of name of the association and because of the fact that people have moved on, um, they, they have been facilitated in being able to, you know, tipex that part of their history out of the books in many respects. And I think it needs to be front and center and and i think that it's it's something that they should be you know forever and eternally ashamed about but that they should be able to stand up as a new youthful organization and say we learn from this uh, we we have grown because of this um, and we uh, will never ever hopefully uh, let this happen again and we are indebted to those people that have gone through this uh, and we will forever be in their debt and we could never express our sorrow about how they suffered. We could never uh, express how deeply uh, we feel for them. But an awful lot of the people that walked out of that meeting or that I referred to earlier or an awful lot of the people that were in the Swimming Association at that time um, they're the ones that have to live with their conscience about how they behaved uh, during that period of time. Uh, and um, knowing how some of them behaved, I don't think uh, they could ever, ever look themselves in the mirror and say, I acted well uh, during that period. Carrie O'Toole, it's been such a pleasure to have this conversation on the podcast. Thank you so much for doing Irishman Abroad. And thank you so much for everything you've done for these people, these victims, and for future generations of Irish children that might find themselves in similar predicaments. It's a pleasure, Charlotte. Keep up the good work. Thank you very much. Thank you. What can you say? What can you say about the man? Uh, I, I'm just in awe of him and what he's done of those victims uh, who are still coming forward and showing the courage they have and of course, again, massive shout out to Mark Horgan and um, what he did with the podcast and how it continues to find even more justice. I mean, the first question in this episode was about justice. And it, but as Gary said, there's there's different forms of it and uh, it's different to everybody uh, on the subject of justice. I I've just been stunned by what's taking place in America this week. Marion McKeown and I talked about it on Friday about what was coming down the line about the gun law decision that the Supreme Court made and how baffling that was I could barely continue the podcast when I realised the ramifications of it 
we're going to have to talk about Roe v. Wade next Friday. If there's any questions you want to put to Marion, if there's any topic you feel needs to be covered on that show or on this show, please do get in touch, irishmanabroadpodcast at gmail.com. It seems trivial to talk about the Irishman running abroad half marathon challenge, but we need these things. And Sonia Sullivan is doing an unbelievable job coaching all of these athletes from the four corners of the world with her training plan you can do it too if any if if i can run you can do it i am loving the community that this is creating uh, the amount of you that are on board and doing it in a bleak time for the world there are these rays of hope and cracks of light and i really do feel that the irishman running abroad half marathon challenge heading to antrim on august 28th is one of those in it together moments that uh, remind you that people are good uh, at the centre of it all Uh, we'll be talking to Sonia again of course on Wednesday don't miss that one and if you haven't already pop over to YouTube and subscribe to my channel over there there's more stuff more comedy content uh, and my special Notions 11 is going up there today that's Sunday It's going up on there for the first time to be available to uh, everybody, everywhere in the world. It was for a time, of course, available on the RTE player, which is something that not a lot of people could access, as it turns out. Uh, But it's now going to be freely available to everybody on YouTube. So I'd love it if you went over there and gave me a subscription or uh, just clicked on the like button uh, or spread the word, shared the special to anyone you think might enjoy it next week on the big sunday interview i will have george hamilton and this is an interview that sports fans and uh, anyone with an ounce of nostalgia for the 80s and 90s will love his new book the nation holds its breath tells the story of the jack charlton years and his time in it for 10 years jack charlton brought our country to a new place and he was there to see every minute of it it's such a fun chat with George Hamilton don't miss that next Sunday here in full of course on Patreon and as I said I'll be back with Marion McKeown on Friday take care of yourselves and I will talk to you then